Thank you, Seth, and good morning. It's good to see all of you here. Nice crowd this morning. Our text is uh, Joshua chapter 15, and as you can see, it's a long text, 63 verses. But a lot of this, if you've read it, has to do with geography and cities. It's about Judah and its territory. The, uh, the land at this point in the book is being uh, uh, apportioned out to the tribes. Their inheritance is being given to them, and Judah is the first to receive it. And so in the first 12 verses, you have the geography of the land, of the, of the borders of Judah, and then from verses 21 through verse 62 are a list of the cities that are there. And I don't know that we need to read through all of that. What I'm going to do is look at the passage that I think is the, really the heart of what we want to study this morning, and that's verses 13 through 19. It continues the story of Caleb that we began last week in chapter 14. So we're going to look at verses 13 through 19. I'll make reference to the other portions of the, uh, of the chapter in the lesson itself. But beginning with verse 13. Now he gave to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, a portion among the sons of Judah, according to the command of the Lord to Joshua, namely Kiriat Arba, Arba being the father of Anak, that is Hebron. Caleb drove out from there the three sons of Anak, Sheshai, and Ahiman, and Talmai, the children of Anak. Then he went up from there against the inhabitants of Debir. Now the name of Debir formerly was Kiriat Sefer. And Caleb said, The one who attacks Kiriat Sefer and captures it, I will give him Aksa, my daughter, as a wife. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, captured it. So he gave Aksa, his daughter, as a wife. It came about that when she came to him, she persuaded him to ask her father for a field. So she alighted from the donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you want? Then she said, Give me a blessing. Since you have given me the land of the Negev, give me also springs of water. So he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Now, as I thought about this passage and prepared it, I thought if I were to write a sentence that summarizes it, it would be something like, living under the governance of the sovereign God as he moves the ages to their appointed end in the kingdom of God. I think that's really the lesson that we should take out of this. And hopefully that is uh, what we will understand it to, to be and will uh, have application. History has wars with some ominous names, like the Hundred Years' War which was fought between England and France in the Middle Ages. Then there's the Thirty Years' War, a war of religion that was fought up and down Germany for a generation with consequences that lasted for centuries. Those and other wars like them are called protracted conflicts, prolonged conflicts. The term can also be applied to battles like the Battle of the Bulge in World War II that lasted for five weeks in winter. One of the greatest battles in the Bible and in history is Gideon's fight with the Midianites when 300 men of Israel defeated an army of 135,000. It's found in Judges chapter 7 and 8. They attacked at night with trumpets and torches. The Midianites were caught by surprise and in their confusion fought against themselves and then fled across the Jordan River. Gideon gave chase. His 300 are described as weary yet pursuing. And that went on for days. 
Well, that can be exhausting. It was for the 300, but they didn't stop. They didn't declare victory and go home. They pursued until they completed the mission and ended the scourge of the Midianites. Well, there's a lesson in that for us. We are in a a spiritual war that is continual. It is a protracted conflict. It is long. It never ends this side of heaven. And we get weary. But we can't let up ever. We can't stop pursuing. The Scot, Andrew Bonar, gave good spiritual counsel when he wrote, let us be as watchful after the victory as before the battle. It's advice Israel needed in its war on the Canaanites. It was a successful war. It lasted seven years. And by the time Joshua divided up Canaan among the tribes, they were war-weary. They were ready to receive their inheritance. That's what these last chapters, chapters 14 through 19, are about. Dividing up the land uh, for the tribes, for their inheritance. It was time to do that, to settle in, to work and worship. And yet... All through these chapters, we read statements like, but they did not drive out the Canaanites. Or, the Canaanites persisted in living in the land. That meant, while they were building their nation, they had to be citizen soldiers. They had to be warriors as well as farmers and shepherds. And in our passage, Joshua 15, we get a model of that with Caleb, where his story concludes. Chapter 14 began the story. He asked Joshua for the the land that God had promised to him 45 years earlier. And now he takes possession of it. It's recorded in in verses 13 through 19. It is um, kind of a spiritual nugget surrounded by some mundane details, geographical details in the first part of the chapter, and then those of the, the, the number of cities that they had within their territory. Uh, Caleb was of the tribe of Judah, and in chapter 15, the boundaries of Judah's territory are given. The chapter begins with, now the lot for the tribe of the sons of Judah. Their territory was located in the southern part of Canaan, and its borders are described in the first 12 verses. Generally, we can say the the boundaries extended from west, from east to west, from the western shore of the Dead Sea to the Mediterranean, and then north to south from the rim, uh, northern rim of the Dead Sea down to the river of Egypt, which is not the Nile River as we might think, but Wadi El Arish, and you look on your maps, you can see that it's sort of the eastern part of the uh, Sinai Desert. Judah is listed first, and it's given more space than any of the other tribes, with far more cities listed. Something like 122 cities are listed in verses 21 through 62, and all of that in order to reflect Judah's importance. It was the first of the tribes, the the tribe of Israel's kings, even though Judah was not the firstborn. Reuben was. Judah was the fourth son of Jacob after his older brothers, Simeon and Levi. But all three disqualified themselves from being head of the family by sin. So it's the story of our spiritual struggle, our spiritual battle. Reuben was disqualified because of immorality. Simeon and Levi because of anger and violence. It's all recounted in Genesis 49 when Jacob blessed his sons before he died. In Genesis 49 verses 8 through 12, he blessed Judah. He said, your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Judah is a lion's whelp. Now those statements may refer to David, the warrior king. 
But then in verse 10, Jacob prophesied, the, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. The word Shiloh is probably best understood as a combination of Hebrew words shy and low. Together they mean to whom it belongs or to whose it is. Jacob's promise was that the scepter would not depart from Judah until the final owner of it, the final king of the tribe of Judah, came. The one whose it is. And ultimately, that is Christ, the Messiah, who, to whom the scepter belongs. He is the Lion of the tribe of David. And the promise of the scepter and the coming king begins to take shape with the giving of land to Judah. This is the initial fulfillment of Jacob's prophecy, which will ultimately be fulfilled when Christ returns to reign. But this and all the allotments uh, uh, to the tribes, which fulfills Jacob's blessings, indicate something about history, that it has fulfillment, that it has a goal. History is not meaningless. And I think we have a type of that, an illustration of that, in the giving of the land, the inheritance that they received. Now, I say it, it, history has a goal, it has a, uh, a purpose, it's not meaningless. That's unique to Christianity. That's unique to the Scriptures, to all of the Bible. The ancient world had no concept of history with meaning. The Greeks had their historians, but they didn't see history as moving in a linear direction, as moving toward a goal with a purpose. It was just events repeating themselves in an endless cycle. It's the same with modern materialism. There is no meaning to things. There's no meaning to life. The Bible is clear. There is meaning. Time is moving toward an appointed goal, the, 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 the worldwide kingdom of God. History has meaning, and that means our lives have meaning. What we do now counts for eternity. And what is given in verses 13 through 19 sets an example of how we are to live in the present with the conclusion of Caleb's story and the conquest of Hebron and the surrounding cities. Now, he wasn't alone in what he did. Caleb conquered with the help of a warrior named Othniel. But first, Caleb accomplished his first goal of taking Hebron and correcting the original sin of 45 years earlier and justifying God. Verse 13, now he gave to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, a portion among the sons of Judah, according to the command of the Lord to Joshua, namely Kiriat Arba, Arba being the father of Anak, that is Hebron. Caleb drove out from there the three sons of Anak, Sheshai and Ahiman and Talmai, the children of Anak. Now, Numbers 13 gives us the, uh, the account of the 12 spies going into Canaan and scouting out the land. Uh, this was where they, they searched. And these three giants here were there then. At least their names are mentioned in Numbers 13, verse 22. So, they so terrified the nation that the nation lost faith in the Lord God. There are giants in the land. And they live in giant cities. So they lost confidence. They lost faith in the Lord. But Caleb never did. And he longed for the day when he could return, thrash the giants, and prove the Lord is almighty, and He's more than good for His word. 
But there are other cities to conquer. We read in verse 15, Then he went up from there against the inhabitants of Debir. Now the name of Debir formerly was Kiriat Sefer. And Caleb said, The one who attacks Kiriat Sefer and captures it, I will give him Aksa, my daughter, as a wife. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, captured it so that he gave him Aksa, his daughter, as a wife. Now, Debir is a city that's mentioned back in chapter 10 as one of the cities that Joshua captured during the southern campaign. You remember they began conquering the land with Jericho, then Ai, and then the men of Gibeon asked for help. They've made this bargain with them, this covenant with them by trickery. And they go to defend that that. The, that city against this southern army of Canaanites, and they defeat them. Then they move to the north and conduct a war, northern campaign against the, um, the northern part of, the, of Canaan. So Hebron was captured then, and Debir was captured then as well. But now they're being recaptured. And so we have to ask ourselves, what has happened here? And what this shows, I think, is the nature of the, uh, of the war that they and that we face and why constant vigilance is necessary. Because when Joshua and the army of Israel marched off from the south to the north, the enemy reconstituted itself and moved back in. As Andrew Bonar warned, let us be as watchful after the victory as before the battle. We have an enemy that never sleeps and never accepts defeat. It's always looking for weakness. So this was a recapture of those cities. And here, Caleb's example was copied by Othniel, showing the people... Again, uh, the path to success in war. And that path is faith in the Lord and courageous obedience. It took effort on their part. The promises of God must be appropriated. They must be believed and obeyed. This is our responsibility as as the agents of the Lord. We must uh, believe what He has promised and we must act upon it. And the Lord will always prove himself to be faithful and bless the obedient. Caleb believed that. And he gave incentive to fight by offering his daughter Aksa for a wife to the man who captured Kiriat Sefer. Now that mean the meaning of that uh, name Kiriat is village or city and Sefer is book. So this is city of the book or city of books. And that name might suggest that this was a city of learning. Perhaps this is where the University of Canaan was located. Or perhaps it housed a great library that kept all of the the myths of Baal. And uh, this was an important place for them in religion. Maybe it was a heavily fortified city. It it certainly was an important city to them and considered a great prize since Caleb offered his daughter as a reward for valiant effort and success. Fathers had complete authority over their daughters then. Saul, you remember, perhaps, when uh, he was facing this challenge of the giant in the Valley of Elah, he uh, made the same offer of his daughter in marriage to the man who killed Goliath. And I suppose as we look at that, it might seem a bit unfair to Aksa, who had no say in the matter. But in this case, it guaranteed that uh, her husband would be the best and the bravest of Judah's warriors. And more importantly, it illustrates a truth. That the Lord, our captain, 
offers rewards in the spiritual battle that we fight. We find that uh, throughout the scriptures. We find it throughout the New Testament. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15, when in the end our lives are judged, evaluated, sifted, as it were, through fire, the ones of value which have been well built on the foundation of Christ, on service to Him, they will remain as gold, silver, and precious stones. Now I want to qualify something in my statement because when I say value, God values every life of His, of his church, His sheep, His people. He purchased them by the blood of His Son. But, and, and I don't want us to think that our value or our rewards are based simply on the things we do. Christianity is not just about doing. It's essentially about a relationship. And you'll remember when the Lord speaks to the seven churches of Asia, Asia Minor, He has something to deal with some of them, most of them. And the first one is the church at Ephesus. And he says to them, he says, I, I know your deeds. I know your toil and your perseverance. Well, you stop right there and think, this is an active church, diligent in its service to the Lord. But then he says, but I have this against you. You've left your first love. That's the essence of our Christian life. It is a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and through Him, the triune God, it is a relationship of love. And yes, we must be active. We must be bearing fruit, but it's the fruit we bear as a result of our love for Him and our devotion to Him. And that life has great rewards. You see it in other places. James chapter 1, verse 12 Second Peter, or rather 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, Paul knew he had a, a crown awaiting for him as he was leaving this world. Which again is proof that what we do in the present counts for the future. The Lord rewards those who serve Him. And that should be incentive for labor. So Othniel responded to this offer, this reward, to Caleb's, Caleb's challenge, and emerged as a leader. He would become the first judge of Israel after the death of Joshua. His career is recorded in Judges chapters 1 and 3. He was a man much like Caleb. He was courageous and a leader who was willing and eager to attempt difficult and dangerous tasks for God. He was a man of faith. It's often through a, a crisis that God raises up leaders in nations, in the church. They step forward, not without preparation. Maybe years of preparation have occurred, and then the moment comes. We prepare by being responsible in the moment. Every day, doing what we are supposed to be doing. Being faithful. And in, in spiritual things, living obediently. Knowing God. Growing in that relationship. Developing in wisdom. We can assume that Othniel had preparation. David had preparation before fighting Goliath. He killed a bear and a lion while defending the flock. And Othniel certainly fought battles and had the example before him of Caleb, a great warrior. And they happened to be relatives. Othniel was his nephew. But Othniel not only received a bride through his valor, he also got a valuable wedding gift when Aksa asked for a blessing from her father. And in this we see a lot of Caleb in her. It's not uh, completely clear, but it, it appears in verse 18 that she has to persuade Othniel to ask Caleb for this, for this gift or blessing. 
But the word persuade has a kind of uh, negative nuance to it. It's, it suggests to entice or to urge, which suggests that uh, the, the request, at least in the thought of uh, Othniel, might not have been quite appropriate. It was a bold request, and Othniel may, may not have been completely persuaded that he was the one that should ask, because we read on in verse 18, she's the one who dismounts from her donkey and makes the request. It's a bold request she's going to make. But I think it, it's a, an example of what, what the expression is, um, the apple doesn't fall, fall very far from the tree, and you see a lot of, of Caleb in her. Aksa resembled her father in courage. Uh, uh, Caleb did not hesitate to ask Joshua for his inheritance. And she wasn't shy about making her request of him. We, he asked what she wanted, and we read in verse 19, then she said, Give me a blessing since you have given me the land of the Negev. Give me also springs of water. So he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Now the Negev, you, I'm sure you know, is a semi-arid region. It's where the patriarchs lived. It's uh, where we read of them in the book of Genesis, uh, digging wells. Abraham did that. That's particularly characteristic of Isaac, digging wells and finding water. And the reason is because water is life, and it's scarce in that region. So Aksa was greatly... Um, grateful, I think, for the gift of land, the gift of the Negev, but she requested a field with springs of water because land without water is of very little value. It was within her father's power to give it, and so she asked for it, and she got it. Now, the story is simple, and the story is direct, and it's an example of courage, as I've suggested, Caleb made his request of Joshua based on God's word, the promise that God had given him because he was a faithful spy. He was promised an inheritance in the land of Canaan, and he sought it and got it. And here, Aksa makes her request of Caleb based on wisdom. She was bold. She did what she needed to do. All three people in this passage give Israel a lesson on life. Be bold. Walk by faith. Live by revelation and wisdom. And specifically here, it's those who seek that find. It's those who ask that receive. She asked for something that was important. Her request was not frivolous. It was necessary. It was good. And she received it. She asked for springs of water. She received the upper springs and the lower springs. Now, if, K if Caleb would give what was best and necessary to his child, will not God give to Israel what is best when they sought it from him? Especially when they were obedient? Well, of course he would. And he does that for us too. Paul refers to the Lord at the end of Ephesians 3 as Him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. Mike quoted that verse in the Sunday school hour. Uh, that, that's how we live successfully in the, in the world. Walking with the Lord and asking Him for blessing. When we ask according to His will, He gives. So all three were examples to Israel uh, of how to receive blessings and how to carry on the fight against Canaanites. Uh, go at it with confidence and with faith. David Livingston was one of the great missionaries of the 19th century and became one of the great heroes of the Victorian age. He was a man of great courage and selflessness, and he took the gospel to Africa. He came to South Africa and then went north. And he went into areas that, that had never been penetrated, really, uh, were very, uh, fairly unknown. He went out into the bush, and as he came to these various tribes, 
And the Africans were very wary of the Europeans, and they had good reason to, but they met him, and he was able to win a hearing with them and give the gospel, and he kept pushing into new areas that had never been penetrated before. And at one point, he's communicating with the, um, the mission station, who are the ones that are telling him where he can and cannot go, and, and, and Livingston says to them, I'll go anywhere, provided it be forward. And that's how he lived his life. It's an exemplary life and not a life that uh, is characteristic of most people. Uh, but it's an exemplary life, and it's the kind of life that I think we see exhibited here in, in these men, Caleb and Othniel, and, and the daughter as well, Aksa, bold in their approach to life and, and claiming the things of God and pursuing the things of God, going forward like Livingston did. Now, the remaining verses, verses 20 through 63, are a lengthy list of the cities within the boundary of Judah. And there are well over 100 listed here. I, I think it's 122, but if you count them up, you may find I'm off by a, a city or two. It shows the scale of Judah's territory. It was large. And, and that indicates the importance of that Judah had as a tribe. It also, and, and mainly this, showed the Lord's faithfulness. In Deuteronomy 6, He promised to give Israel great and splendid cities, which they did not build, and houses full of good things, which they did not fill. They had those. He provided according to His promise. But still, many of those cities were inhabited with Canaanites. Israel was not completely successful in driving them out. The chapter ends with a, a discouraging fact, an alarming fact. Verse 63, Now as for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the sons of Judah, could not drive them out. So the Jebusites live with the sons of Judah at Jerusalem until this day. Jerusalem is right on the border between Benjamin and Judah, and actually it belongs to the tribe of Benjamin. But Judah attacked, and according to Judges chapter 1, verse 8, they captured Jerusalem. But here they didn't. There's no contradictions, what we saw earlier. What, what happened is, again, they, they had an initial victory over the Jebusites, but then the Jebusites regrouped and regained the city and became entrenched in it. Later in, in Judges 1, verse 21, it states that Benjamin could not capture it either. Why is that? What happened? Was it because those Jebusites were just too strong? Or... The men of Judah and the men of Benjamin weren't strong enough. They didn't have the skill of Caleb and Othniel. Or those Jebusites just had a better army. Well, I think Calvin got it right. He said, no, it's not that. And then he made a good point. Had they exerted themselves to the full measure of their strength and failed of success, the dishonor would have fallen on God himself. And that cannot be. Now, the reason for their failure, for Judah's failure, then Benjamin's failure, was their failure. Their weakness, their weariness. War gets old. In one of Spurgeon's sermons, he, he spoke of those who think they can do nothing. He said, sometimes there is a want of way because there is a want of will. And then he continues... Though I do not go, on, go so far as to allege this in, is in is your case, speaking to his uh, congregation, we know too well that cannot often does mean will not. And not have triumphed may mean that you have not tried. I think that's true. It's true of us in our daily lives. Husbands and wives might, might say that 
they just can't get along, or they, they can't discipline their children, or we're too busy, we can't find time to study and pray. Well, the real problem is they can't do these things because they won't do them. I, I don't want to simplify some complicated issues, and some are very difficult. But the reality is, um, if it's God's will, then we need to do it. And the problem is it, 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 with us, not with Him. Paul put the answer to the problem in, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. This is the, the nature of the, of the Christian life, which is the nature of the spiritual battle we're in. We can't do anything in our own strength, but we can do it in the strength of our Lord. And that's what Paul was saying. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. If it is God's will, whether a, a wife is being a godly helper or a husband being a loving leader, and I like what Mike said, the note that he gave to his son and son-in-law, as a husband, make it your goal to serve your wife as soon as you get up in the morning. That is a good goal and a good purpose. That's what we are to be. We are to be, men are to be leaders in the home, but they're to be loving leaders. And they are to be servants. That's what our Savior was. And so, whether it's that or... or or all of us being careful students of the Word of God and diligent in our prayer life, if it's God's will, then we can do it. And that should be our mental attitude. That's the way Caleb approached the giants. That's the way Othniel did as well. But for Israel, years of war, the seven years' war, had taken its toll. The nation was tired of fighting the good fight. They had become restless under those, that, uh, that, that discipline. They, that, and that becomes evident in the remaining chapters. Their failure would have consequences. As the book of Judges shows, the nation that conquered the Canaanites would become servants of the Canaanites and of others. After seven years of war, they were weary, so weary they were not pursuing. So we read statements like, but they did not drive out the Canaanites, or the Canaanites persisted in living in that land, or as for the Jebusites, they could not drive them out. There's another statement we, we find repeated and. I think that may give us a, a clue to this failure. It's at the end of chapters 11 and 14. You will recall it. Then the land had rest from war. I like translating that. The land was quiet from war. That's the normal meaning of this word that's translated rest. All quiet on the western front. The guns are silent. There's peace. That's a time of joy. It's a time of, of rest or relaxing. The long conflict is over. That's a blessing. We can leave the trenches and the foxholes. Israel could lay down their swords and take up their plows. But quiet can be deceiving, especially in the spirits of conflict, because the enemy can also be quiet. But it never rests. It's always active. And when we relax, we let our guard down and the enemy strikes. That happened here. The giants moved back into Hebron. The Jebusites reconquered Jerusalem. It happened to David. He enjoyed victory after victory, but then he decided he needed some R&R. &R. He needed some... Uh, some rest and relaxation, some rest and recuperation. So he skipped the battle for some of that, for some quietness at home. And that's when he had his great moral failure. Peace and quiet is a blessing. We need physical and spiritual rest. We need recuperation. We can burn out. 
That's, that happens too. That's, that's part of the battle that we must guard against. But we never, never take off our armor. And we never rest from fellowship with the Lord. We always need to be in study, and we need to be in prayer, and we need to be in communion with the saints. We need to be together functioning as the body, encouraging and supporting one another. We learn from failure. David learned the forgiveness and grace of God from his great failure. Some of the great Psalms came out of that experience. We learn that too. We, we learn from the difficulties of life. And we learn that from those failures and from those struggles, we learn that we cannot succeed on our own. We cannot succeed in our own strength, but only through the sovereign help of God. I think I may have said this last week. I'll say it again. I cannot emphasize enough, and I won't stop emphasizing the great and fundamental truth of God's absolute sovereignty. Because we can only succeed by leaning wholly on Him. And we won't do that if we don't understand that He's absolutely sovereign. And when we understand that He is, that He is sovereign in the little things of life, the daily details of life, we will understand that He is sovereign over the great things as well. He is sovereign over time and history. And that's a great encouragement should be. The description of Christ in, in Hebrews chapter 1 is uh, to the point. It was a, a, a description by the author that was carefully crafted. He says of Christ, He upholds all things. And what that word uphold means is not just holding them up like like some great atlas holding the world up, but it really means carrying all things, bearing all things along. So your life and time and everything is being carried by Christ along a path to a destination, an appointed end. And this portion of the book of Joshua illustrates that great truth. The conquest of Canaan was a, a means to an end, which was the allotment of the land, which was the inheritance of the tribes. And time is moving toward the allotment of the inheritance for the people of God and the kingdom of God. There's meaning to history. We are moving to an age of quiet from conflict, of peace and glory. But today is the day of war. It's the time of spiritual conflict. It is daily and it is long. It is the protracted conflict. And we can, can fight with confidence and boldness because Christ, our Joshua, has already defeated the enemy. He did that at the cross. And he gained for himself and for us, the kingdom to come. We are moving toward our inheritance. Now, all that we do now in this spiritual war that we fight will count for that day and count for all eternity. So we're not to let up. It would be like Caleb, Othniel, and Oxa. We are to be courageous and persistent. As Paul told the Ephesians in Ephesians 6, be strong in the Lord, put on the full armor of God, and stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And the fact is, in the midst of conflict, we have peace and we have quiet. We have the quiet life because every believer in Jesus Christ has peace with God. No condemnation. We have entered into spiritual rest. We have justification. We have been declared righteous before God. We have been acquitted of our crimes, absolved of our debts, forgiven of our sins because Christ paid the penalty. He paid the price at His death. He suffered the penalty in our place. We got all of that at the moment of faith. 
when we believed in Christ as Lord and Savior. And at that moment, that very moment, we joined ourselves to Him, to His sacrifice and righteousness. And that's how God sees us in Christ, joined to Him as perfect and righteous as He is. Well, what a blessing that is. And so we go forward with confidence that we're in Him, we're secure, and we're able. We're able to do the things that He would have us to do. But if you've not believed in Christ, it's a very different thing for you. You have none of that. You're still guilty. And time and history are moving toward a very different end for you. One of darkness and doom. Leave that. Come to Christ. Trust in Him. Through faith, lay hold of the cross. His sacrifice and payment for sin. And receive at that moment forgiveness and life everlasting. We have that by God's grace. We receive it through faith alone. So seek and you will find. Ask and it will be given. May God help you to do that. And help all of us to live that life that we've seen patterned here in these of this chapter. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us and for the three examples we have here. Uh, Caleb, Othniel, Aksa, various ways, but they show us the kind of life we're to live in, in this present age, this age of spiritual conflict. We live under your sovereign hand. We live under your sovereign governance as you are moving the ages to their glorious end in the kingdom of God. But in this meantime, in this in-between time, we fight the fight. Help us to do that faithfully and well. There's great, great reward in it. May we understand that. And may we do it out of great love for you and for all that you've done for us. And Father, we're, we're now going to look to you and remember what you have done for us in your Son as we take the Lord's Supper and we pray that you would prepare our hearts for that. What a, a blessing to do this, to recall as we do weekly now the, the person and work of your Son and what he's done for us. As we reflect upon that, it should create within us hearts of gratitude and love and a desire to serve from the right motive. So Lord, I pray that you would create that within us. We look to you to bless now. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I want to welcome everyone to this Lord's Supper service today. The New Testament tells us that the Lord's Supper is an ordinance instituted by our Lord at his last Passover, that the early church practiced it when they gathered together to break bread on the first day of the week, and that the Apostle Paul reminded us that as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When we remember the Lord's death, we are celebrating his vicarious death on the cross for sinners. By his death, Jesus became our Passover lamb. God told the Israelites to use the Passover lamb as a sacrifice in Egypt. On the night, God struck down the firstborn sons of every household. This event was used by God to lead Pharaoh to release the Israelites from, from slavery. After that night, God instructed the Israelites to observe the Passover meal as a lasting memorial. God said that when he saw the lamb's blood on the doorframe of a house, he would pass over that house and not permit the destroyer to enter. Any house without the blood of the lamb would have their firstborn son struck down that night. The New Testament establishes a relationship between this Passover lamb and the ultimate Passover lamb, Christ Jesus. The prophet John the Baptist recognized Jesus as the lamb of God. And the apostle Peter links the lamb without defect with Christ, whom he calls a lamb without blemish or defect. 
Jesus is qualified to be called the one without blemish because his life was completely free from sin. In Revelation, John the Apostle sees Jesus as a lamb looking as if it had been slain. The Bible says that Christ's sacrificial blood has been applied to believers, and thus they have escaped eternal death. Just as the Passover lamb's applied blood caused the destroyer to pass over each household, so Christ's applied blood causes God's judgment to pass over sinners and gives life to believers. As the first Passover marked the Hebrews' release from the Egyptian slavery, so the death of Christ marks our release from the slavery of sin. As the first Passover was to be held in remembrance of an annual feast, so Christians are to remember the Lord's death until he returns. The Old Testament Passover lamb was a mere foreshadowing of the better and final Passover lamb, Christ Jesus. Through his sinless life and sacrificial death, Jesus became the only one capable of giving people a way to escape death and a sure hope of salvation and eternal life. From its inception, Believer's Chapel has followed the New Testament example and has observed the Lord's Supper weekly. We welcome all believers in the atoning work of Christ Jesus to participate as we commemorate the Lord's death for our sin. Let me give thanks for the bread. Dear Father, we thank you for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, to redeem us and to take our place in paying the penalty for our sin. Help us never to forget that the price paid for our redemption was the sacrificial death of Christ Jesus, our Redeemer. Help us to remember that Christ, who knew no sin, became sin for us. And we also thank you for the grace given us to believe in Christ's vicarious death for us. And now we ask that you bless us as we partake of the bread, which is a symbol of the body of the Lord Jesus, the Lamb who was slain to save his people from their sins. In Christ's name, amen. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. We've been bought with a price. What is that price? What did God pay to have us and for us to have Him and have His life, eternal life and eternal blessing, it's the blood of Christ. It's His sacrifice, His death in our behalf. And we're to remember that. Just as that blood of the Lamb that Mark referred to on the first Passover delivered the Israelites from judgment, so too the blood of Christ has delivered us from judgment. And not only that, given us life everlasting. So as I say, we're to remember that, and as we remember it, we're to remember we belong to Him. He has bought us. We're not our own. And we're to live our lives in a way that brings glory to Him. Every time we come to this supper, it should remind us of our new life and how we're to live it. Live it to His glory. Let me give thanks for the cup. Father, thank You for this cup, this wine that speaks to us of the death of your son, the blood that was shed in that violent death, which was a sacrificial death, which bought us for him and paid for all of our sins and paid up our debts and has gained forgiveness and life everlasting for us. Help us to begin to fathom the greatness of that gift of life that we have at the cost of his life and his death. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let me close with the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Till next week, keep looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. And I hope to see you next week. Bye.